know, we talk about heroes up and down. Th this guy truly was a hero. I see Dunham in most Marines daily. You know, that I want to run into people like Jason Dunham. I want to be, you know, like you said w when you picked this guy, I want to be that guy. Can you keep a secret? <laughs> Changing parts of mind. Changing, 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 you're listening to Changing Hearts and Minds, a show about reviving the warrior spirit and remembering the past to improve our future. I'm your host, Jeff Adamick, and let's get this party started. Ladies and gentlemen, am I totally screwed or what? <laughs> You're funny. You're funny. I want to discuss all this behavior. Let me out of here! Welcome, guys, to, the net, to this episode of Changing Hearts and Minds. I am your host, Jeff. I don't know if you guys heard a couple weeks ago, but I had started doing a show with uh, my friend Alabella. He came on, uh, former Colonel United States Army. He came on, and we talked about who his hero was. Uh, he came on the show, and he brought up Dick Bong. Uh, now he's known as Richard Bong. I wouldn't call him. I didn't want him calling him Dick because, you know, as you guys heard in the episode, it, it cracked me up. And 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 Albert has a way of really getting under my skin as far as getting me laughing and cracking up. And I want to. You know, I'm going to be honest with you guys. That was one of the most fun shows I've ever had. So what I decided to do after I after that show and because of the good time that I had and, and the subject matter was I came up with this plan that I was going to start going to my friends, all my friends, uh, military friends, that is. And I was going to ask them who their hero slash role model slash, you know, person that they felt was the person that they looked to while they were in the military as an inspiration. And I got quite a, quite a good amount of feedback from a lot of good friends. And so what I've decided to do is I'm going to start a series here, and this is going to be part two. Uh, as you remember, the episode that just got released said part one on it. It said part one because there was multiple parts. The rest of it's not going to be about about uh, Richard Bong. It's going to be about my military friends, who their heroes are. Um, we're even going to get into mine at one point. I'll bring Andrew McDowell on from all my historical episodes, and I'll have him give me an interview, and we'll talk about my, my historical uh, role model figure. But today we're going to talk about uh, a new guy, um, Although I was in the Army, this guy was a Marine. Uh, no big deal. I work with him at Cisco. Me and this guy have gotten to be pretty good friends. He is my <laughs> go-to geek. Uh, so when I want to geek out on stuff, uh, you know, superhero stuff, brand new movies and everything, this is the guy I go to. Oh, but, yeah. Uh, yeah, there he is right there. So let's uh, jump into it. What is the definition of unconditional love? What is the one thing that can be done to show the unshakable devotion you have for something or someone? We throw the word hero around these days with unvetted recklessness. Unconditional love, devotion, this can be expressed without argument one way and one way only. To knowingly lay down your life to save someone. When an act has no other possible result but your own death, and you, without hesitation or doubt, take those actions that will result in your death for the sake of others and their benefit, that is love. The Bible verse is clear, John 15, 13, greater love hath no man than this, that the man lay down his life for his friends. Today we're going to talk about a Marine who had laid down his life for his friends, Jason Dunham. But first, let me introduce you to the guy whose idea it was to bring this hero to the forefront, Mr. Mark Gay. Mark Gay was from Detroit, Michigan. He joined the Marines in 2008, and he went through his boot at Paris Island. He served from 2008 to 2013 as an intelligent analyst, 0231, in the 2nd Light Armored Recon Battalion. He operated with Charlie Company with the LAR Battalion and deployed to Afghanistan in 2011. He worked within the Helmand Afghanistan province along the Paki border, patrolling, vetting, and all those other things that intelligence guys do. Do you, do you still do you still attend Way Community College? No, I uh, I picked up the associates last summer. Well, okay, so. hey, congratulations on that. Hey guys, these hey. are my friends, and you can see how much I know about what's going on in their personal lives. <laughs> uh, right awesome. now, Mark works as a network engineer at Cisco. He works with the voice and collaboration technology, and all around good guy. Mark, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you, Jeff, for having me, man. And uh, uh, that quote that you posted uh, earlier. That's, that's one of those things, kind of like Bible school, you know, you're like, you hear it all the time, um, but it doesn't really become relevant until you, you really kind of see that applied in, in real life. And you're like, man, like it's such a, a sacrifice is, is, is like a true atonement to, to friendship. And that's kind of a reason why I chose Jason Dunham. But yeah, so I guess you wanted me to talk a little bit about myself before we go. Oh, well, I, I pre really appreciate you just jumping right in there and, you know, and hosting the show for me. 
and do uh, would you like me to? Yes, I would love for you to. Well, why don't you pretend pretend like we're both sitting in front of about a million people we don't know because technically we're sitting in front of about a million people we don't know, and okay. uh, they all know all about me. I mean, who doesn't okay. know about me? If you just want to look up arrogant and awesome in the dictionary, there's a picture of me and a picture of me. I did see that. Yeah. Yep. So and, and as and as most people will. So go ahead, Mark. Why don't you tell 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 our tell our listeners? And today there are listeners. So tell our listeners a little bit about yourself. Uh, yeah, sure. So, um, wow, where do I start? So, uh, grew up in Detroit, Michigan. Never really saw myself being in the military. First generation. Um, went to high school in uh, Redford. I don't know if anybody's from Michigan, but they know Redford. Uh, if you are. I don't know if anyone's from Michigan. Um, there's plenty of people from Michigan. You mean you don't yeah, know if anyone it, that's listening is from Michigan? I, listening from Michigan, but still. Um, I'm, sure, I'm sure I'll find someone out there. Yeah, you maybe, maybe. Cary is an uh, area for centralized area for relocated Yankees, I think that is. So at least somebody local. Is that what they call Cary, North Carolina? That is centralized what they call area for relocating Yankees. That's, that's yeah, it's a little weird. And it's, relevant, I think. Yeah, it is. But um, But yeah, so more about me. Uh, yeah, so I grew up in Michigan, <laughs> decided I wasn't ready for college because uh, back in 2008, I was just a hooligan who didn't really understand um, how the world worked. I was more of a pants around, you know, hanging low and hip hop blasting loud, acting a fool with my friends. And I had to realize, you know what, I'm, I'm not mature enough. So my dad was like, hey, you should uh, think about the military. And I was like, yeah, I don't think that's for me, really. But you know what, I'll give it a try. I think it was 10th grade. I went to the Naval Academy. Um, real interesting trip. Spent a week out there. And on the way there, there was a Marine that picked me up to the airport, took me there. It was an all-inclusive uh, package where they basically took us through the whole military lifestyle uh, where you could be a student there, try to hate us for like a day or so. And uh, it was actually really eye-opening. But the one thing that stuck with me was the the Marine that, that took me to and from the whole thing. And I, we just started hanging out on Saturdays and I joined in, stepped up and um, went to boot camp about six months later. So yeah, Mark, um, you've listened to a couple of the episodes. You know that I'm not going to let it, let it go that you mentioned that you went out to go to Annapolis, Maryland and got picked up by a Marine. So you went to go visit the Navy and Marines in, in the fashion that Marines do, they, they smelled you a mile away and they picked you up. Isn't that the whole reason why Marines are on Navy ships anyway? Because sheep are too obvious? Yeah, I, I guess it kind of is. <laughs> no, you, know, um, you guys know, I'm, you Marines know I'm kidding. And yeah, those, yeah. Those Marines who don't know I'm kidding, I'm kidding. But uh, no, the, uh, it was kind of backwards. Usually it's the Navy that's taken the Marines place. It was the Marines who took us to the Navy. But yeah, it's uh, it's an interesting thing, though. <laughs> they can always smell a Marine. They're like, hey, you like uh you like you like working out and fighting and all this other shit? And I'm just like, uh, bro, do you even lift? Do you even <laughs> lift? Do you even lift, bro? <laughs> yeah, but yeah, I made some of the best friends of of my life just uh, at that little recruiting station in uh, in the middle of Detroit. It was funny, but it, it was everything around me that that showed me that man, Marines are, are a little bit different. You know, we're a little bit weirder, a little bit crazy, but at the same time, you know, we uh, we have a lot of honor, a lot of pride. In, in our culture and value. And so, yeah, I would say that Marines, um, the esprit de corps that Marines have is by far one of the most impressive things um, mm -hmm. I think I've ever seen with, with, with an organization or a fraternity, uh, if you will, of, of people. And you know, you know how I feel about Marines. Uh, you and I have had long conversations working together um, mm -hmm. oh, yeah. that, I, that, I, that I, I was, you know, in little known fact, I was going to be a Marine. And let's, let's, we can geek out a little bit, guys. So here's a little bit of backstory on Jeff Adamick. Jeff Adamick wanted to be a Marine because of one movie. And that movie was Aliens. Uh, James Cameron, uh, in 1986, made the movie Aliens, and I first saw the Colonial Marine Corps. And although those are not the Marines, as far as a young kid is concerned in New Jersey who know nothing, knows nothing about the military, who comes from a Navy family, by, to be quite honest with you, I saw the Marines in that movie as exactly what I wanted, what I thought was the, the epitome of, of, of military and, and, you know, giving a shit about your brothers and sisters and taking care of each other. You know, it has a lot, you know, still a lot to do with what we're going to talk about today laying down your life and doing what you need to do for the team and for your, your brother and sisters of the right and left of you. And the Marines have always been that example to me of people who will ultimately lay down their lives, you know, for them, for their fellow Marines, for Americans going to try to join the Marine Corps when I was getting out of high school and uh, found out you could not be a medic and that the only way you could be a medic in the Marine Corps is by being a corpsman. Obviously, you know that. Um, yep. And I was not joining the Navy. I did not want to get put on a boat, um, which was odd. Why would I be joining the Marine Corps if I didn't want to be put on a boat? 
you were probably gonna. <laughs> yeah, I was probably going to. So it, it's it's a in in its best in in the best way possible. It was the best best option for me to end up in the army and be able to do the things that I was able to do in the army. Uh, being a ranger, uh, being a green beret, working with some tier one units and doing some cool stuff. I'm glad I did it. But I also always keep keep in, in the back of my mind my 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 utmost respect for Marines and and what they are and what they do and the fact that. Um, always faithful, man. It's Semper Fi is not is not just a term that you guys throw around. You guys really do mean it. And uh, if anything, uh, the friendship you and I have is indication enough that that always faithful is something that you guys take very very seriously. So. Oh yeah, no joke. So uh, let's let's talk a little bit about Jason Dunham. Jason Dunham, guys. A lot of people aren't going to know the name, um, and that's all right because that's what we're here for. We're here to teach you guys um, who this gentleman was. This 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 hero. Jason Dunham was born November 10th, 1981 in Skyo, New York. Now, that's S-C-I-O. If there's somebody out there from New York who knows how to, sp- to say that correctly, if I said it wrong, first of all, A, I apologize. <laughs> and B, B, this is my show. If I want to fucking call it Skagakagoko, New York, I fucking will. Um, <laughs> and you'll just live with it because ultimately this is my show. And I'm sure Jason, wherever Jason is right now, he doesn't mind you know, whether or not I say it just as long as I get the word Marine right. So he was born in 1981 in Skyline, New York, resided there his entire life with his parents, Dan and Deb, and his three siblings. He had two brothers and a sister. Coincidentally, he was born on the, tw- the, on the, 2000, the 206th anniversary of the founding of the United States Marine Corps. The Marine Ooh, Corps wow. birthday is what day? November 10th, maybe. <laughs> November 10th. And now here's the thing, guys. You are never going to find a Marine who doesn't know that. And every single year when I hear about the Marine Corps birthday from a Marine, they never get it wrong. They know exactly what it was and w- what it was. And real quick, before we go on, uh, since this is a historical thing, why don't we talk about how the Marine Corps was founded? I think it's very interesting to uh, to think that the Marine Corps <laughs> is the in- the only armed service that started as a bar fight. Yep, it was uh, back in Tun Tavern. That's a legendary place that all Marines know. Any Marine, you can ask them. Marine Corps was born in a bar. And we about, live man. by that every day. Oh yeah, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> that's what that's and that, that's honestly that's honestly God why I love the Marines so much. And there is no one in the entire world. And as you guys listen back to my last show that I had with Al Albert Labella on, uh, you can tell that I really do enjoy having a couple drinks every once in a while and, and letting loose, letting my hair down, letting some three bangers off in his yard while during Fourth of July, or or getting semi drunk and sleeping through the greatest Super Bowl ever. Um, those are the kind of things I do. So anything, anything has to do with, with letting your hair loose and getting down, man, I, I'm down with him. So having the Marine Corps have that kind of history, fantastic. And, and you know, one day I'm going to have a show where we talk about all the different um, – I maybe get Michael Penny on from Cigars and Sea Stories, maybe get Mark back on, uh, a couple other Marines, uh, Bennett Tanton. We'll get these guys on, and we'll talk about some of the ins and outs of Marine Corps, you know, why they're called Leathernecks, you know, whether or not um, my jar would have – my head would have fit in that jar and all, all that kind of all that kind of other stuff. Um, <laughs> That Marines love. Jason Dunham, born on the 206th anniversary of the, the United States Marine Corps. He graduated from uh, Skyo High School in 2000. Uh, he played basketball for his high school team, so he was an athlete beforehand. And after graduating from recruit training on 27 October 2000 from Golf Company Platoon 2092, he served as a security forces sentry at the Naval Submarine Base Kings Bay in Georgia until 2003. And in early 2004, he was serving as a squad leader with the 4th Platoon, Company K, 3rd Battalion, 7th Marine Regiment, 1st Marine Division, 1 Marine Expeditionary Force. His unit was based in Al-Karabala. Or Al-Karabala. Um, first of all, not to... Uh, what is up with the, the Spanish middle name length of these units? You know, that's something I'm really not sure of. You, you know um, what I'm saying? You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Company K, third battalion. That, that's like my name is Francisca Amenta Madumba da Bumba da Bubba da Bibi da Bibi da Bibi da Bibi da Jones. I mean, that's what it reminds me of. Is I'm some Spanish person who's got three thirteen thousand middle names. I mean, I, I get it. You gotta you gotta have your your breakdown. But you, do you know anything about the history behind why it's got to be broken down so much? Well, it's I think it's a distinction of the Marine Corps. Like it's just separate from the Army. Army, it's like once you're a sergeant, you're a sergeant. You know, you sergeant at E five, you're a sergeant. At E7, but the Marine Corps is, you know, you're 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 a sergeant, you're a sergeant major, you're a staff sergeant. It's there's there's a lot of delineation in that, and it kind of go. I mean, it's kind of excessive for most Army people to be like, what you have to like say each different one. That's right, a little right. bit much, but it goes back to what you're saying, man. That esprit de corps, that honor. They want to spell out every damn last letter. 
because you'll know that I am this person from 3rd Battalion, 7th Marine Regiment. It's it's a very uh, historically uh, honoring thing to kind of note those 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 names. Right. And, uh, you know, a little story, a little side story. So 1999, um, class 0899, I attend Ranger School. There was a Marine Corps Ranger instructor who was, uh, and, I, and I don't recall the gentleman's name, you know, forgive me. Mm-hmm. I'm sure he's out there somewhere listening to this show saying, that son of a bitch, doesn't remember my name. But what I do remember is running into him for the first time, first, second, third, fourth, fifth, probably about 10 times before I finally got it. And I say, hey, Sergeant, and I immediately was corrected. Now, my name is Gun- Gunnery Sergeant, blah, blah, blah. And over and over and over again. Yes, it, it, there is something to be said about, you know, saying, you know, the man earned, he earned his rank. Um, the least you could do is say it right. Um, and being a special forces guy originally, you know, to begin with, I don't like being called by my rank or when I was in being called by my rank. My name was not, you know, Sergeant First Class Jeff Adamick. My name was Jeff. And uh, having Marines over in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan call me Gunny all the time <laughs> always kind of uh, <laughs> always kind of took me back a little bit. Yeah. So uh, April 14, 2004, mm-hmm. Jason Dunham was uh, in Husaba, Iraq. Husaba, Iraq. Uh, again, you know, I don't know all these names, so you'll have to forgive me. Talk to me a little bit about Mark. Talk to me a little bit about what what happened on April 14, 2004, with with uh, Mr. Dunham. Well. Um... It's an, an, like any other day in uh, overseas in the fucking the sand pit. Um, you know, there's there's a call. There's always something going on. Um, and so J- Corporal Jason Dunham, he had a, a basic mission. And so just uh, some information about him. He was a squad leader, 3rd Battalion. So, you know, obviously he's the one to make the call and, you know, kind of instruct his Marines on where to go, how to go. It's a squad leader sort of thing. But he also didn't have to be out there. Um he actually had did an extension. I think it was like two or three months from his EAS to to maintain his position as a squad leader in Afghanistan. What what is an EAS, Mark? For for those that are out so there, it's uh, that means. it's EAS end of service agreement. That's all. So, so it would be like your 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 um, ETS date for for the army you know, estimated time right. in service. So he wasn't just going home. He was going home to get out of the Marines. Is that correct? Right. He was he was done and through. But he he uh, he he extended just to stay with his Marines, support them because he was their squad leader. He didn't feel like abandoning them would be the appropriate thing to do, especially um, so close to the end. So he was doing his duty. uh, And I think that says something to who he is. And a call came through that uh, battalion commander's convoy was under attack by small arms fire and rocket propelled grenades. You know, this is not a joke. For, for anybody to no, hear. Not at all. Not at all. It's, it's a very serious situation for all of our joking around and stuff like that. Yeah, very serious uh, uh, convoy under attack. Uh, he was he was 4th Platoon, and uh, it says dispatch, but let's call it what it was, you know, by, by, by him volunteering to stay on. And I agree with you wholeheartedly that it's, it does say quite a bit about his character because we both know that you, you have times over there where you've, you've had about enough of it. You're ready to go home. He was getting ready to go home and, and be done you know, for the rest of his life. But yet he decided to stay with his Marines and, you know, saying, saying, you know, what that says about his character, immeasurable, immeasurable amount of just sacrifice in and of itself. I mean, he's putting his life on hold to stay there with his Marines um, as a squad leader, you know, and, and we tend to not know it. And I'm sure you would agree with me. We tend to not know it at the time, but the military keeps on rolling without us. You know, um, we think mm-hmm. that the military is going to come to a screeching halt the second that we get out. Uh, and generally, it's a it's a it's a massive ego ego slap in the face when we get out and realize that, you know, you're not you're there one day, you're not there the next. But, you know, they keep on going and people fail to realize that, you know, for over 200 years, the United States military as a whole has been able to function without Corporal Mark A and, and, and Sergeant First Class Jeff Adamick and, you know, the, or you were a corporal, is that correct? When you got out, got out, sergeant. Oh, sergeant. So Sergeant Mark A, you know, he gets out. Oh man, I don't mean to take it away from you. It's all good. You, you, you the man. You the man. You court. You, you're an NCO. Bottom line is, you're an NCO. So exactly. you know, the 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 Marine Corps was was existing far be, before Mark was was an NCO, and the United States Army was existed long before Jeff was a senior non commissioned officer, and and they both have been able to continue on, although not as well as when we were there. Um, they've been able to continue on <laughs> without us. And yep. the same thing with this guy, you know, he maybe didn't know that, but he, he did, did say a lot about him. And so he gets dispatched out there 
and if you don't mind, I like it a little bit a little bit more of what I what I've been able to find. Mm-hmm. Um, his squad intercepted a number of cars spotted near the scene of the attack. Uh, which the patrol detained to search for weapons. When the squad approached a white Toyota Land cr- Cruiser, it discovered AK-47s. The driver exited and attacked the Marines in an attempt to flee. So he basically got out and he att- attacked the Marines with only the intent to try to find an escape route. Uh, so that's how I read this, as far as I know it. Um, Dunham responded by closing in for hand-to-hand combat to subdue him. Now, guys, we don't live in a world where we got swords and, you know, battle axes and we run across big giant open fields getting, you know, having a, a blue, a blue painted clad, you know, eighties drunk actor telling us that, you know, they can take our lives, but they'll never take our freedom. We don't have that going on anymore in combat. So when you hear about a modern day combat, and this is modern day combat, this is, this is 2004. When you hear about somebody going to hand to hand combat, that is a significant escalation of the situation um massively significant maybe two times i can think about hand-to-hand combat and one of them was just me you know holding a guy down and the other one was 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 a guy coming around from behind something to uh to grab me and try to choke me and then that that's it you know I mean, those stories are not cool at all compared to this but um hand-to-hand combat mark that that, that that's pretty significant you know, this guy got to that point with these guys during the firefight the individual okay so it says the individual dropped an armed hand grenade. Now, that's not something you just drop. So I'm willing to bet that this guy had made a decision to pull pull the pin, let the spoon fly, and drop drop this grenade in in the vicinity of these Marines. What do you think? Oh, definitely. Um, I mean, just from grenade training myself, I know you. There's a little preparation that that takes, and it's some little hand eye coordination. You got to kind of realize, hey, I got to pull this pin. And then have it in enough time to try to break free of Marines and in the struggle release it. it that's that's full intent. Yeah, I mean, we we tend to think that you can you know grab us you know grab a pin with your teeth and pull them out because of all the movies that we see, but it is not it is not that simple. It's kind of hard. It is. It's it is very it, well when you consider what you think it is compared yeah. to what it actually is. It's it's very hard to pull the pin on a grenade. Uh, with good in, with good reason. This is not something you want to fuck around with, and just have out there willy nilly, just you know, falling off friggin' kit into a truck. Um, right. So this is something that you know you have to make a definitive effort. You, there is intent behind uh, this this grenade being dropped. Dunham, in an attempt to save the rest of his men, deliberately threw himself on the grenade, attempting to use his helmet to shield himself and others from the explosion, warning the others as he did this to watch his hands. Dunham, the insurgent, and two other Marines nearby were all wounded by grenade fragments. But this man threw himself on the grenade. This is the most, in my opinion, one of the most cliche-ish tasks you ever hear about someone doing, you know, throwing themselves on the grenade. Um, we use it in terms, it's become a, it's become a part of our, our vernacular as, as military people. Um, you're going to a club and someone's got someone's to gotta pick up the fat chick, ugly chick. So, you know, <laughs> who's going to jump on the grenade? Um, yeah. There's you know stories about guys in Vietnam in World War II jumping on the grenade. Uh, there is no there is no misunderstanding what the end result of jumping on this grenade is going to be. Oh, absolutely not. He knew. Let's talk about, and I'm I'm assuming this is the reason. Is is what talk about why this this event to you is the reason why you chose. Jason Dunham. Well, I mean, it, it really was a culmination of my entire military career, um, kind of taking in the, you know, the little bits and pieces that you hear about people like this and Jason Dunham being one of them, uh, going all the way back to boot camp, really, it started, there's an actual obstacle course for Marines, um, named after Jason Dunham. Um, and it's both on East coast and West coast. And you'll find yourself, um, I think it was, you had to do this like a search and seizure, um, identifying a threat and, and handling it, just kind of like what his scenario was as well. And at, sometimes I think there was a, an impromptu grenade dropped and, and you had to react in that sort of way. And I, you know, coming from Detroit, you know, I don't, I never know anything about military. I'm like, wait, you want me to do what? <laughs> so uh, it, it was, it was kind of a, an eye opener to kind of hear about this story that somebody would do this. And, and, and I hate to say it, but most times in 
urban environments, you know, it's it's every man for himself. You know, you're hey, you handle you and I handle mine. So coming to to this new world saying, hey, ultimate sacrifice right here, split second go. Something alien to me. It didn't really stick at first. You know, you're you're when you're in boot camp, you're just going through the motions. You can't wait for the day to end. But I kind of saw it in 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 day to, you know, day to day, Marines would do things that were were sacrificial. They would end up doing, you know, I had a, a corporal, uh, Corporal Burke, an exceptional Marine, too smart for his own good, probably works at the Pentagon or something right now. He, that's where we last heard of him. But he was not only strict, focused, and memory like an elephant, but he would sacrifice for us. We would see it, and it's kind of like that lead by example piece. And I couldn't, I didn't piece it together at the time, you know, but Thinking back, I'm like, this is something that follows Marines, that constant sacrifice. Going forward, I, I really kind of took in the, the example of Dunham saying, I see Dunham in most Marines daily. That, that's, um, a, that's a really good that's a really good statement. I, I like that that you that you see you see Corporal Dunham in, in Marines daily because well, like let's be honest, I mean they, they, they train you guys and they, they create a sense of um conditioned memory muscle memory, if you will, by going through these obstacle courses and, and, and dropping these grenades randomly for, you know, what are you going to do, Marine, blah, blah, you know, or, or the Ranger, what are you going to do, PL kind of thing. Mm-hmm. It's not something that, ex- it, you know, we talk about sacrifice and doing what you need to do for the team beforehand, but this guy made a decision without that conditioning. Um, right. The reason why they try to condition those things into people is because it's against it's against our common nature to to throw ourselves on top of a grenade. I mean, that in and of itself, um, let's, I mean, we could only had hoped in the end that the grenade was a dud. Unfortunately, it was not. Um, Corporal Dunham was severely injured. And eight days later, he died of his wounds. Um, but he really did put himself in such a back door to his men, to the other Marines, to everything that was going on around there that his sacrifice is beyond i mean you can't you can't you can't put you can't say enough about somebody who does that for the people around them and you know we talk about heroes up and down this guy truly was a hero no, taking nothing away from guys like you know like Richard Bong who who went up and 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 sacri- you know put himself you know put his men first by going up and fighting fighting the enemy but you know, your intent is, you know, as Patton says, it's, you know, your, your intent is not to die for your country. Your intent is to make the other poor bastard die for his. And, you know, repeat that enough times to where you win, uh, whether it's by attrition or just by, you know, outmaneuvering people. But this, but Corporal Dunham, I mean, he, he really sets standards so high for what is supposed to be the way that we treat each other um, and take care of each other. That it's really just it's 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 impressive. It's impressive. It's inspiring and and unbelievable. Um, it is. Oh yeah. Corporal Dunham was severely wounded, as I said, by the grenade blast. Was immediately evacuated. Within days, he arrived at the National Naval Naval Medical Center in Bethesda, Maryland, in a coma, uh, where he was being treated for his injuries. And after being diagnosed with massive brain damage, uh, which I know very well about. And deemed unlikely to ever recover, he was taken off of life support eight days later, on April 22, 2004. Shortly beforehand, the Commandant of the Marine Corps, Michael Haig, is that pronounced right? Michael Haig, Michael Hagee? Lisa. Uh, presented Dunham with the Purple Heart. Uh, Dunham's parents were at his bedside when he died. He was buried in Fairlawn Cemetery in Skyo, New York. In 2004, Michael M. Phillips, staff writer for the Wall Street Journal, wrote an article summarizing Dunham's actions that appeared on page A1 of the May 25th edition in 2005. Phillips published a Gift of Valor war story, which told Dunham's life up to that point. I'm going to read the citation for Corporal Dunham's uh, Medal of Honor, which he was put in for the Medal of Honor. And in January 11, 2007, in the East Room of the White House, President Bush presented Corporal Dunham's family with the Medal of Honor in a ceremony. The citation read, the President of the United States, in the name of the Congress, takes pride in presenting the Medal of Honor posthumously to Corporal Jason L. Dunham, United States Marine Corps, for services as set forth in the following citation. 
For conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity at the risk of his life above and beyond the call of duty, while serving as a rifle squad leader, 4th Platoon, Company K, 3rd Battalion, 7th Marines, reinforced, Regimental Combat Team 7, 1st Marine Division, reinforced. On 14 April 2004, Corporal Dunham's squad was conducting a reconnaissance mission in the town of Karabala, Iraq, when they heard rocket-propelled grenades and small arms fire erupt approximately 2 kilometers to the west. Corporal Dunham led his, co his combined anti-armored tank towards the engagement to provide fire support to the battalion commander's convoy, which had been ambushed as it was traveling to Camp Hayabusa, or Hayasaba, excuse me. As Corporal Dunham and his Marines advanced, they quickly became, began to receive enemy fire. Corporal Dunham ordered his squad to dismount their vehicles and led one of his fire teams on foot several blocks south of the ambushed convoy. Discovering seven Iraqi vehicles in a column attempting to depart, Corporal Dunham and his team stopped the vehicles to search them for weapons. As they approached the vehicles, an insurgent leapt out and attacked Corporal Dunham. Corporal Dunham wrestled the insurgent to the ground and in the ensuing struggle saw that the insurgent released a grenade. Corporal Dunham immediately alerted his fellow Marines to the threat. Aware of the imminent danger and without hesitation, Corporal Dunham covered the grenade with his helmet and his body, bearing the brunt of the explosion and shielding the Marines in his vicinity from the blast. In an ultimate and selfless act of bravery in which he was mortally wounded, he saved the lives of at least two fellow Marines. By his undaunted courage, intrepid fighting spirit, and unwavering devotion to duty, Corporal Dunham gallantly gave his life for his country, thereby reflecting great credit upon himself and upholding the highest traditions of the Marine Corps and the United States Naval Service. Pretty impressive, guys. I, I, I can't say enough about this guy, and it's, it's kind of a sombering, or a sobering, sober and somber story with this this action that he did i really think it it was a, a a monumental thing especially for all of marine corps because i don't think uh any kind of sacrifice like that has been done since i don't know uh for a while uh, yeah, vietnam at least maybe yeah as far as theaters go um so it was something that was that was very important it was very important for for marines to acknowledge this um because it's not every day that you see somebody jump on a grenade, no, literally. No, no, definitely, um, definitely not. And uh, it, it just has to be something uh, has to be said to, to to that thought process. And it's something I think that more people should think about in the grand scheme of things, because a lot of people aren't really willing to stretch themselves out for others. Um, and then sometimes, you know, southern hospitality, or you know, you have those individuals who are who do. Um, exemplify those that sacrificial mentality but i feel like as of late uh people are kind of more distant i know the technology era puts us at at a screen's length away from people um and and i i kind of see that that things are kind of changing in a way that that doesn't exemplify that jason dunham uh sort of mentality and i think that's something people need to really reflect on is that we're, we're not going to get as far on our own Sometimes you need to rely on those people to 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 sacrifice and then also be the one to sacrifice and have people rely on you. And it, it goes because it goes both ways. Um, I, I can say for one, I've had a lot of people in my life, especially you, sacrifice both time, effort and energy <laughs> to make sure I keep my shit straight. And that's something that that needs to be done 10 times fold. So I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And I think it's well said. As you say, the, uh, the going places together. I think uh, you and I have a have a colleague, uh, Josh, and yep. you know, uh, uh, out of respect for Josh, I won't throw his whole name out there. But there is a gentleman that me and me and Mark both know. His name is Josh. He is he is a veteran himself, also, and he had made a statement one time that really stuck with me. I think it's a great, great comment. If you want to go somewhere quick, you go alone. If you want to go far, you go together, and although that's not his statement and it comes from somewhere else, uh, that is the first time I had ever heard it. And it sticks with me when I hear something like that. And it, uh, it really is a great comment. And it really goes back to the, to the mindset and the thought process that, that Corporal uh, Dunham had back in those times was that, you know, he's, you're a team. You're there as a team. You're looking out for one another. You're taking care of one another. And, uh, I mean, really, you know, as far as he was concerned, he really took care of his guys to the ultimate. I mean, we, we said it over and over again, and I feel like we're beating a dead horse with it, but I, I don't care. I think it needs to be said over and over again. He knew. He knew what the end result of what his actions were going to be. And it wasn't like he stopped for a moment to consider it. He just did it. And there's – you 
can't say enough about that kind of stuff. Real quick, let's uh, just, I want to list his other awards. This is not going to be a really long list of awards, guys. I think what a lot of people don't realize is Corporal Dunham was, he was a one, one term uh, Marine, uh, he, he, you know, young guy, young guy, one term, uh, he, his awards as it's listed, obviously the medal of honor, uh, purple heart, combat action ribbon, the Navy notorious unit commendation, the Marine Corps good conduct medal. And guys, I'm going to tell you something real quick before we go on. The second you hear me or anyone else, when I'm listing these start talking about good conduct medals, that's because we're, we're throwing things in there to try to give the guy a couple more awards so that we're not listing two or three. And I'm not doing it to, to shame Corporal Dunham at all. I'm doing it to make sure that we list uh, all his deserving awards. Uh, the National Defense Service Medal, the Iraq Campaign Medal with one campaign star, the Global War on Terrorism Service Medal, the Navy Sea Service Deployment Ribbon, the Sharpshooter Rifle Marksmanship Badge, and the Expert Pistol Marksmanship Badge. Corporal Jason Dunham, we, we absolutely uh, salute you, sir, uh, wherever it is you are now and what you have done and accomplished uh, and what you have done for, for guys like myself and Mark with the inspiration and, and sacrifice that, that you have used, that you had done and has been used now as a, as a method of, of inspiring and teaching young, young people today what it is to, to sacrifice and put yourself out there. Mark, let's talk real quick, you know, while we have the time here. Let's oh, talk yeah. a little bit about what your some of some of the things that you've been able to learn from your time in the military that have that have helped you as a civilian um, as far as leadership is concerned. What are some of the things that you've taken away from the military or, or examples of leadership that you can you can talk to that that have been able to help you as, as a civilian after getting out? Since, you know, this show is a lot about transitioning, getting out, and we know a lot of our focus is the mil civilians out there, and you and I are both examples of, of being successful as we got out, so uh, take a moment and talk a little bit about that for me, if you will. Yeah, absolutely, man. You see, like, when you're in the Marine Corps, or in any kind of branch of service, there's always stellar examples of leadership, and they're constantly floating around you. Um, sometimes you see those leaders who are like, wait a minute, I see this guy skating off, I don't know. But then you have plenty of other people who, who show you that there's like an un, undying energy in them to, to, to help others and to lead. And I think uh, taking that in from a civilian perspective, I can only think of it in, in one way. And I thought this was a really good example. I don't know if anybody uh, is, is big on movies, but uh, the movie The Martian was, is a perfect example. I think it was uh, he, he, he was at a point where he was making progress got stranded on Mars, long story short, um, and he was trying to uh, cultivate the land there. Made some progress, started getting some leaves going, fresh air, water dripping, and then all of a sudden, some, there's a hole tears in something, kills everything, it's all fucked. And if anybody who's been in the military long enough knows, shit can, it can go to shit real quick. Um, and so, tying those two together, the... The example is that even though shit goes down, um, you got to pick yourself right up and, and keep pushing towards that objective. And I think the Marine Corps taught me that very well because there was a lot of times I couldn't do it. I was like, this is, I, I can't, I can't do this anymore. I can't, I don't know what else to do next. And there were, there were leaders out there that showed me, hey, no, there's another way. There's an extra step. And I think some people throw their hands up and they're like, ah, you know, I'm done. This is too much. Uh, but just like that movie, The Martian, like, I mean, dude, like sometimes you're all you got and you've got to push forward. Um, so I think I take that with me. Um, and I think that's something that that's that you kind of need to, like, really use as a tool that 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 memory that, hey, there's those leaders out there that, that have shown you a way to 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 do it or to get it done another way. Um, and that perseverance is something that, that, that needs to follow. So that's one thing that I've taken from the military. And a lot of times, especially with dealing with IT, I, don't, I know you and I have these conversations sometimes where we're like, dude, this is some advanced shit. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> this is some, some real complex. I don't know. I didn't, I didn't study it in school enough, long enough to, to figure this, this stuff out. <laughs> What do, you, what do you mean? I don't know how to count to five without using my other hand, and, and now, now you want me to count to ten. I can't. It's too yeah, much. I can't, I can't <laughs> do it. It's, it's far too. Can't get it and, done with this equipment. Right. 
And so it, it's it, you got to kind of dig in. It's a little bit of grit. It's a little bit of perseverance. But that is one ultimate value that I've taken here. It's like, hey, read that manual one more time. You, you, you might not you might have missed something. And that's that's critical. I think that's a, a big task there. Yeah, it also it also says, I mean, the don't quit. You, yeah, as you guys who have listened to the show know you. I'm a, I'm a big fan of the you don't quit. Um, quitting is if you ever quit, it just becomes too easy to quit the next time and keep moving on. And that and that's what Mark's talking about. If I'm interpreting it right, it, it's it's there. There's never a, there's never a reason to quit. You may not have all the answers, but you have part of them. Uh, and as long as you don't quit. And here's the second part. Willing to accept, ask for and accept help when it's when it's come when it comes to you. I would never ever, hopefully, put myself in the situation where my pride, and, and I have in the past, but you know, hopefully, as as an educator and a person moving forward, I would never put myself in the situation where, as if just because I've been at times a mentor to Mark, um, I would never put myself in the position where if he knew more than I did about something, be too proud or arrogant to ask for help if I needed it. And uh, I think that's something that I've taken from, from the military is, is the ability to accept the fact that we're, we're not going to know everything. We're not going to be able to do everything on our own and to accept the help and, and everything when it comes our way. It, this is going to sound like it's like I'm never going to speak to Mark again, but honestly, brother, it's, it's, it's a pleasure to, for me working with, with, with people like you. I got lucky here at Cisco to, to work around guys like you and everything like that. So, you know, I appreciate everything that you your leadership techniques uh, and and believe it or not man it is it is leadership being able Amen. to accept being able to accept people telling you how to do things um being able to listen and and show people that this is how you follow is just as much a leadership technique as anything else when they say oh you have to be a good leader to be a good follower that doesn't mean that you have to have been led that means that you have to be able to when it's the time to to sit down shut up and just do what you're told to do and that in and of itself is a leadership skill. And it's a very hard leadership skill for leaders to, to be able to emulate later on. And you, you do it massively well. You, you're constantly always looking for new ways to, to get things done. You don't have any issue with asking for help. Uh, if I remember correctly, you, you had an interview at one point. You came to me and you're like, uh, hey, what do you think I should do for this interview? And you know, I need some help with it. And although I couldn't help you technically, I was able to go find your room <laughs> and get you get you a hey. room with a whiteboard in there that you could go write stuff on. And, and uh, it it made all the difference, man. So I got the job I got. Well, I, I appreciate you saying yeah. that, but you and I both know that you got that job because you were the right man for it, and you interviewed and <laughs> and and did a good job with it. But it, those are the kind of things that that I like that I want my our listeners to to hear is that. Uh, we rely on each other um, many times, and uh, you know, me and Mark don't work in the same team anymore. Damned if I'm not going to pick up the phone when I need to and, and call him up and ask him for help, and, and he, he does the same with me. And you know, generally we pick up the phone and, we, and we're talking about you know, you know the new Alien Covenant movie. Or guys, to be quite honest with you, man, me and Mark are just two geeks. We're we are two comic book geeks who just love Thank movies and, and spend most of our time, you know, talking about you know. Thanos and, and and the new the the new Guardians of the Galaxy movie and all, all that kind of nonsense. <laughs> it's but, Marvel and DC. It's, yeah, it's hell a, yeah. I mean, for, man, we can make a whole show just about that, and, and maybe we should. Yeah, maybe, maybe I'd be maybe down. We should. We definitely should be down for that. But that that's the kind of stuff I'm talking about. Find the people around you that are going to be beneficial to you as as an, as an individual as you move on and get out of the military. And even if you're not out of the military, if you're if you're a civilian, you've got to find somebody that you're going to be able to put faith in and be able to trust. And I know it's really hard nowadays for people to put that in there, but you have to find someone that you're willing to to confide in, trust, and and rely on if you need them. What do you What do you think about that, Mark? Do you think that that's something that's uh, yeah. beneficial oh, yeah. for people? I think it's it's critical, and I know that some people may be uh, off put to the wording, but use and be used. You know. Yeah, no, uh, no, that's definitely a good good way of putting it. Because a lot of times people do have that hard time extending themselves even though they may be willing to to do something for you or maybe that person that you need uh, sometimes you got to put your step for your foot forward first and say hey you know uh i can do this for you help you out here i see you have a problem and then that opens themselves to be like wow this, this person is a uh, is pretty good it's an okay guy uh how what, what can i do for you um so a lot of times it's like it goes both ways and sometimes it helps to to open yourself up and uh I know I was when I first got to this to Cisco, I was a little bit shy. I was a little bit quiet. I was like, ah, I don't know, you know, I don't know anybody here. Uh, and you open yourself up. I mean, you, you're always open. <laughs> like you're just like, hey, what's going on? Hey, what you doing? 
And I'm like, oh, oh, shoot, this guy right here is crazy. Like he's, But he reminds me of the people I used to work with, the Marines around me. So uh, I like him. I'm going I'm to I'm I'm move towards this guy and see what I can do for him and what he can do for me. So it's, it's that, and it goes back to Jason sacrificing. Sometimes you do got to go out of your way. Oh, shit, you know, I could be chilling, watching my Netflix. But you know what? Let me go do this for my friend. Um, and that's, that's kind of the thing that I feel like people need to really focus on um, is, is being that reliable person too. Cause once you know that somebody can rely on you, um, and you can rely on them, it, it, it has to be a decently even exchange. Don't, don't kill yourself. Well, it, 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 well, like what you said, it comes down to, all right. So the difference between thinking that someone's got your back and mm-hmm. knowing that someone has your back, uh, is all belief. So if I believe 100% that Mark's got my back, then I don't need to think about it. You know, I don't need to make a decision. I automatically, without fail, 100% trust the fact that he's got my back because I really believe it. And that's not on me to get that belief. It's on me to get you to believe that I got your back by my actions. Uh, Be reliable. Be honest. There is nothing worse than people who are afraid to tell other people they can't do something because they're afraid they're going to disappoint them. I'd rather someone say, I can't do this and be honest with me than to half-ass give me something. And I think that that's something else that, you know, comes down to honesty and everything. But those guys around Jason Dunham, had he survived and, and gone back out with them, um, not that they probably had any doubt that he was looking out for them to begin with, but for God's sakes, man, he put belief in them. He put belief in me that, you know, that I want to run into people like Jason Dunham. I want to be, you know, like you said, when you pick this guy, I want to be that guy. Uh, yep. I don't want to be, I don't want to die. Uh, no one wants to die. And it, there's, that one country song, I don't want to die for you, but I'll do it. Um, it's it's a true story. I mean, no nobody wants to, but what th- that's the thing. They don't want to, but they do it. And that's do. that's the difference between them. So guys, as we get ready to wrap this all up, uh, I want to recommend uh, The Gift of Valor, A War Story by Michael M. Phillips, a uh, Wall Street Journal author who wrote who wrote the uh, summarized article on uh, Jason Dunham's actions, and then he wrote, he wrote this book. Uh, we will have links to that and some other things in the show notes page. I will also have some links in the show notes page to some of the open source Mark Gay social media accounts so that Mark doesn't have a bunch of people he doesn't know, you know, attacking his Facebook, but maybe some of his other ones. I want to take my time to thank Mark for coming on. Uh, as always, brother, I, I'm, I, I can rely on you and I know I can. And, and it was a great, oh, yeah. great choice. And, and thank you for introducing me um, to, the, to the story of Mr. Jason Dunham, Corporal Jason Dunham, true hero. 100 percent in every respect of the words a true hero and and a great choice for for the person that you chose as 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 your military hero so yep couldn't think of anybody better and uh thanks for having me i'm glad to be here and it was uh it was fun it was a good time glad and we'll, we'll have you back on uh when next time i was going to do a review of the movie dunkirk but then i saw Ooh. it and then i saw the movie and so now i don't want to do a review of it so no it's not a bad movie guys it just wasn't as action packed as i had hoped it was a little bit too much drama for me same, having same. said that again thanks for coming on the show and guys i want to tell you again as i tell you always that your entire life is within your hands nobody can tell you what you can or can't do nobody can decide what you can can and can't do but you go out there do not oppress yourself with your own self doubt free yourself free the oppressed the oppressively bear and we will see you guys next week Change your POV and all of it shows can help and heal and even educate. We want you to help us help others. Visit our Patreon page at www.patreon.com slash change your POV. Become a patron of our network and our mission.